It may be cold and rainy out there tonight, but it is alive in here. Amen. Amen. I'm glad that I get to preach tonight after that. So, man, uh, so, so let me just say welcome uh, to you guys who are here at the Conway campus. And let's put our hands together and welcome those who are at our J. Rubin campus. Those who are watching online and at our other campuses. Uh, we love you guys and glad you're here uh, with us uh, to be a part of it. My name is Matt, if I've never had a chance to meet you. I'm one of the pastors. Thank you very much uh, here at The Rock. And, and I just got to say... Um, Last week, Josh, one of our other pastors here at church, if you, if you don't know him, did this thing on stage where he ca- compared a lot of the other staff uh, to Stranger Things characters. <laughs> it's my turn. So, can we zoom in on this? Everybody needs to get a good picture. So, so I found a few, all right? And I was thinking, this is our uh, lovely lead pastor right here. And I I saw these glasses and I was like, what what character is that like? And it made me think, okay, well, maybe he could be most like Barb. If you know Barb from season one, she tragically, uh, well, I won't tell you that, but she had glasses, he had glasses. I was like, well, maybe, but not really. And then I thought, okay, well, then I found this picture. And I was like, nice little shaved head, little buzz cut he's got going on there. And I thought, okay, maybe 11, like when she's got a little shaved head thing going on. And I was like, you know, she kind of like controls power with his mind. He's kind of smart, I guess, if you say that. And then, uh, and then I saw this picture and I was like, you know, our pastor, he's, he's pretty athletic and he's into, you know, athletics and all that. And so it made me think of Bob from season two, because if you recognize Bob, what else was he in? Rudy. Who said Rudy? One person. Yes. So he was in Rudy and I was like, well, you got the guy from Rudy and you got our pastor. He was also Samwise Ganji in Lord of the Rings, which may be, you know, amazing right there. And so they're kind of faithful and they're good friends. And, you know, you can think of that. And then I was like, well, that just doesn't cut it necessarily. And, uh, and, and he also brought up something about me last week that I'm really a geek and I'm into Star Wars and things like that. And he brought that up. And so I was thinking, okay, maybe if we branch out of Stranger Things, maybe if we go into Star Wars, maybe we'll find a character that really resembles our pastor. And so I brought this picture up because here's what you need to know about this picture is, is the day before, this was at Clay's wedding, um, his son Clay. And the day before this, he took several of us guys out to celebrate, kind of do the bachelor thing. And we played uh, par three golf and we played foot golf. And listen, I know he talked a little bit about being an old guy. All right. And uh, he may not be as young as he once was, but he's as good once as he ever was. If you know what I'm talking about, Amen. he whooped our behinds in both par three golf and foot golf. And I was like, I mean, I get it. I don't play golf. I expected him to beat me, which I beat K-Lock, by the way, and he used to be a golf coach, okay? So just for whatever that's worth, I don't even play golf. But I was like, man, you know, it got me thinking, is there, is there a guy in Star Wars who's old? <laughs> but who can still hang with the best of them? And I thought... What better picture of our... Look, they even like leaning the same. You know, they just got it. So, all right, I'm stuck on that screen. Careful, young Padawan. Ah! (laughs) There it goes. You're like, what does that have to do with anything? Nothing. Okay, just payback. So that's all it is. Welcome uh, to The Rock. Glad you're here. So we're going to have to leave that up there because I didn't put another slide in there just yet. So uh, enjoy. So... Here's, uh, if you got a Bible, go to Revelation chapter 4, okay? Or maybe you have an app on your phone or something. Revelation chapter 4, we're going to be in 4 and 5 today. I'll go ahead and jump to the the next thing, but Revelation chapter 4 is where we're going to start. But I need to set it up by asking this question. What or who has your attention? What is it or who is it that has your your attention. Let me, let me explain. I met my wife for the first time back in 2006. Uh, we got married in 2009. And here's the thing about my wife is she, she was another level of woman. Okay. She was focused on the Lord. 
um, she was the kind of girl who she really found her confidence in the Lord, so she didn't feel the need to go around and date a whole bunch of loser guys, okay? She didn't have a history of dating a whole bunch of guys uh, before me because she was very confident. She also didn't feel the need to dress very provocatively or anything like that. She was very confident in her beauty and her identity and who God created her to be. Uh, She was very faithful in her church. And so when I looked at my wife-to-be, I just thought, Man, that is a girl who is focused. That's a woman who she really has her attention uh, aimed at the Lord. Well, she always sort of had my attention, okay? But if, if Kelly was this like great, just amazingly, amazing woman of God, I had a couple problems about me. Number one is I was a young guy who had what I'm going to call is ADSD. You know what I'm talking about? always dating somebody different, okay? You know what I'm talking about? Like, I was always dating the next girl who was coming along, okay? If she kept herself faithful, I was always dating. It was like, date one girl, break up. Date the next girl, break up. I even dated one girl uh, for a while, broke up with her on Friday morning, and went out with another girl on Friday night, okay? I know, don't judge me, all right? Don't judge me. We're in church, okay? And uh, so, so that was one of my problems. The other problem is I was just a punk, okay? I had this like long shaggy hair that I thought was cool at the time. Um, I wore like all these ripped up holy jeans and I had a lip ring, okay? True story, I had a lip ring, there's photos on the internet because I thought I was Blink-182, okay? That's who I thought I was. And, um, And so you get this picture of my wife and then you get this picture of me. But here's the thing, is she always kinda had my attention a little bit. Not my full attention, but just part of it. And I was always like, man, Kelly, like, that's not a girl you play around with. That's a girl you marry. She is wife material. You know, just that, that was kind of my picture of her. And then one day I remember, uh, I was dating a girl at the time who always said, you're going to break up with me for Kelly. And I was always like, no, baby, I'm not going to break up with you for Kelly. Okay. And then one of Kelly's roommates came to me one day and she said, do you like Kelly? And I was like, yeah. And, uh, she was like, well, she likes you but she's tired of waiting on you. So if you're not going to date her, she's going to move on. So now's your chance if you want to be with her. So what did I do? I went and broke up with that girl. <laughs> and I went after Kelly. because, And at that moment, it caught my attention, right? Like, it's, it's time, game, o- game over. It's time to focus my attention on what I really want and desire. And, and here's the funny thing about that is it changed everything, okay? It changed my motives, it changed my actions, because the next day, literally, what I did is I went, I got a haircut, I took out the lip ring, I bought a pair of khaki pants, and I put on a fleece pullover. I didn't even know I owned a fleece pullover at that time, but I put one on because it looked a little cleaner than what I currently wore, because I had my attention focused on the woman that I really wanted to be with. So you're like, what does that got to do with anything? Well, attention is funny. And the thing that has our attention will drive us, right? It'll motivate us. It can change us, just like it changed me when I finally put my attention on my wife-to-be. See, attention can affect our attitude. What has our attention can affect, um, you know, our affections and what we love and how we feel. It can shape kind of our our attitudes in life. It It can just even change who we are and what we do and what drives us in life. So my question is, what, what, what's your, what, what has your attention? What are your eyes sort of fixed on? Because sometimes that can be a good thing and it can be a positive change. And then other times, here's what I know, is it can lead to, it can drive us to despair. It can drive us to loneliness. It can drive us to the chains that we've been so eager to get out of. Right? Anybody with me? You with me? Because I can focus my attention on that that thing in my past. I can focus my attention on that weakness I have. I can focus my attention on the things that I don't like about myself, and it can drive me to a place that I don't really want to be. And so that takes us to Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And you might be going, well, Matt, what does that got to do with anything? Well, let's remember the context of Revelation. That's so important is the context, right? Because Revelation uh, was revealed by Jesus to a guy named John, right? And what's John going through at the time? 
He's exiled, right? He's exiled by the Roman Empire, the Roman government, because he keeps talking about Jesus. His whole life has been faithful to Jesus. And so they, he wouldn't stop talking about him. They were telling him to stop talking about him. So they exiled him to an island where he's all by himself for punishment. And you think he could have had his attention on his circumstances? You think he could have thought, man, this is a bad situation. Woe is me, like things are bad, right? He could have, could have had his attention on the situation around him. But the revelation wasn't just for John. It came to John, but then it was supposed to go through John to the church, right? Because Josh did a great job last week of talking about what the churches were going through. And the churches were going through persecution. The churches were getting a little complacent, right? They, they weren't hot or cold. I wish you were one or the other, but you're lukewarm. Some of them were giving in to sexual sin. Some of them were, were giving themselves to other teachings other than the Bible. And so all of that is where are they putting their attention? Where are they putting their attention? Some of them have taken their attention off of God and Jesus and who he is, and they've put them on other things. So what does God do? Well, what we're about to see is God grabs a hold of John's attention. And God's going to grab a hold of the church's attention. And what I hope tonight is that he will grab a hold of mine and your attention, maybe for the first time ever or maybe in the first time in a long time, but we will really see God for who he is. And he will lock eyes with us tonight. So I hope we can do that. You excited? I'm excited. I'm pumped up. If you're not excited, I'm going to be the only one in here. So Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. I know somebody online or at Jay Rubin's excited with me right now. So after this, Revelation 4, chapter 1. After this, this is John, I what? Looked. Everybody say looked. Looked. I looked. So he looked, right? Fixed his eyes on something, right? And behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the spirit, and behold, a what? Throne. Everybody say throne. Look at your neighbor and say the throne's important. Everybody do it. The throne's important. And the throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that held the appearance of an emerald. Now stop right there for a second. Like, I love this part. I love, this is almost poetry. You almost get this. This feeling that John is sort of reaching to the, the end of the leash of language, trying to come up with a way to describe the God that he's seeing, he's seeing on, on the throne. So he's describing Jasper and Carnelian, and those were precious stones back, back in the day, even in our day, but they had like a burnt orange, like just fiery glow to them. And then the rainbow and had the appearance of an emerald. So you get this, just this idea that like just light is just radiating from God and from the throne. Uh, One of the scriptures in the Bible talks about just an, an unapproachable light of who God is. And you sort of get this just brilliant, just marvelous light picture coming out from the throne and from God. Now what's going on around the throne? Well, verse four says, around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their head. And from the throne came flashes of lightning, and rumblings, and peals of thunder. We just sang about that. We just sang about it. I love it. And before the, what's that word? Throne. We're burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God and before the throne was as it were a sea of glass like crystal. Now you get the picture? You get the whole picture that this throne is a big deal and there's light radiating from it, marvelous light radiating from it, brilliant light radiating from it and lightning is coming out from it and thunder is rolling 
out from it. And then you've got all these people kind of surrounding the throne. We'll see in a little bit. We Kalok just read the verse a, a minute ago about how there was just thousands and millions of angels and creatures and people around the throne. And it's just this throne is the centerpiece of heaven. The throne is the centerpiece of creation. It's the centerpiece of all of the universe. Everything in the universe is revolving around this throne right now. And this is incredible to think about because everything, if you're a student in here and you're, you're studying history or you're studying science or you're studying finance, everything that you study revolves around God, okay? The entire universe is centered around God. God. So all of history is all aligned around God and how great he really is and his plan and how he's working things. Science all revolves around God, right? One of the, one of the uh, great physicists, his name was Heisenberg. He came up with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can Google it or something like that. He said that the first gulp of the natural sciences will lead you to atheism, but at the end of the glass, God awaits you. And I'm like, that's it, right? We, we get this idea that in science that God's not there and God needs to be disproven and this didn't really happen. And what he says, a great physicist even says, no, 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 no. All of the sciences all revolve around God. Like he's in it. He designed it. He thought it up, right? And then all of finance and all economics and everything. And then every one of our jobs all revolve around God. Listen to me, think about it. Think about all these jobs. This is, this is another pastor uh, named Dave Platt said that. He said, says, every job represented in this room centers around God. He says, you will not understand your work rightly as a lawyer or doctor or counselor or teacher or student or consultant or engineer or manager or mechanic or sales rep or stay-at-home mom unless you understand that God is at the center of the universe and everything in your work ultimately revolves around him. That changes the way you go to work. That changes the way you go to class. It changes the way you go to your job because God is at the center. And guess what that means? Guess who's not at the center? Me. Me. <laughs> And you're not at the center, right? The world doesn't revolve around you. You love to tell people that, right? Right? I love to tell people that. Like, I think it revolves around me, but it doesn't. It revolves around God. God is at the center. God is seated on his throne. Everything revolves around him. And what's going on around him while he's on his throne? Watch this. Pick up in verse 6, and it says, And around the throne on each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. Let's just be honest. That's weird. I don't know what it means. Okay, fantastic beast and where to find them right here in Revelation. Okay, I don't get, like, we're not going to go into what does this beast mean and what does that be beast mean and what does this represent, okay, because the Bible doesn't. Okay? The Bible's not worried about what they represent. What it's worried about is what they're doing. You ready? And what are they doing? And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they what? Never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come constantly, 24-7, 365, they are worshiping, praising, singing to God, 24-7, 365, they don't even take off for Christmas, right? And I know Thanksgiving's coming up, and everybody, there's going to be all these articles about, is it unfair for Walmart to open early on Thanksgiving, okay? They never take a day off from praising and worshiping God, and they sing what we just sang. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty declaring he is perfectly holy, perfectly righteous, and sin will not stand in his presence. Okay, he is holy, and he was and is and is to come, meaning he is eternal. He is before time. He is 
after time. He is outside of time. We can create time travel and time machines. And even if we could go all the way back to the beginning of time, he will still be before it. And even if we could go all the way to the end of the time, he will still be after it, right? Because he is eternal. And what does that mean? Why is that encouraging? Because listen, our president will reign for maybe four years, maybe eight years, but his reign will come to an end, right? Every world leader's reign will come to an end. He's writing to John saying, listen, the Roman Empire will come to an end, but who won't come to an end? Whose reign will never come to an end? God. God. He is eternal. Anybody with me? I need you to be with me because I just messed that up and I have no idea how to get back. Man, I was on a roll too. Technology. I'm supposed to be the smart guy, right? There we go. There we go. And so, I need to go back. I need to go back. Jumped ahead, jumped ahead. So, he's eternal. So, he's seated on his throne. Worship is happening all around him 24 7, 360. Five. And then what happens is it says, hey, every time those weird creatures praise God and they're singing out to God, which is all the time, there's these elders around the throne. And this is, it says that when the creatures sing that, the elders fall down on their faces and they begin to sing this. And they say, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created what? All things and by your will your will they existed and were created now listen why is that important why is that important well because god is the creator and we are just created and that means that the roman empire at that time was created by guess who by god that means in our day today, you fast forward to 21st century, that means people who are in ISIS, people who are in terror groups, people who are in Iran, in Syria, people in North Korea were created by God. He is the creator. He holds the world in his hand, right? We can sing about that. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the... Yes, okay, stop right there. We could just keep going, right? He's holding it. The whole thing, he created it. He sustains it. Every breath in your and my lungs comes from him. Every heartbeat in your chest was put there and created by him. And if he stopped it, so would you and so would I. But he is the creator holding this whole world in the hand and it exists for his will. And that's good news. That means he's in control, right? There's nothing outside of his will. He is good. He is holy. He is just. He's the one who is eternal. And if you go, man, does it get any better than that? And then you flip over to chapter 5, and it does just that, and it gets better. Anybody with me? Yeah, you anybody with me? And it gets a little bit better. And you say, how does that get better? That's God. That is the picture of God on his throne. How does it get better than that brilliant just picture well, something happens at the beginning of chapter 5. And God's holding in his hand a scroll. And the scroll has seven seals. And what John sees and recognizes is that nobody is worthy to open the scroll. An angel declares, it says, hey, who is worthy to open the scroll? And scriptures record that no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth is worthy to open the scroll. It's like if you got a letter in the mail, right, and it was addressed to you and it had your name on it, you would say, okay, I'm the one that can open this, right? But imagine if you got a letter in the mail that was addressed to the one who is worthy, right? What would you do? It'd be like, is that for me? Am I worthy? Is, it, is my kids worthy? Okay, make, I'm definitely not, they're definitely not worthy. Like, who's worthy to open this thing, right? Who's... And all of a sudden, that scroll is sitting there, and John realizes no one is worthy. And he breaks down and begins crying because he recognizes no one is worthy. I'm not going to talk about the scroll tonight. Okay, we're going to talk about that more in coming weeks. You can do your own study on that and what's in it and what it means. But no one was worthy to open the scroll until, until 
Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up. And Jesus comes on the scene. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks right up to God the Father on the throne. And he pulls the scroll out. And he alone is able to open the scroll. He is worthy. Why? And the elders began to sing a new song. And they're going to tell us why. And it says this. It says, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were, what? Oh, man. You were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God. Because Jesus alone was perfect and righteous and without sin. And he died on the cross, slain his blood and ransomed his people from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Christians. For those who are believers and followers of Jesus, you and I, that he alone is worthy because he alone is the one who lived without sin. He's the one who left heaven and came to earth and lived the life you and I didn't live, right? And he died the death that we deserved, but he took it upon himself on the cross to die in our place and for our sins. And we have received all of his righteousness from Jesus that he lived and he took on the death penalty in our place and for our sins. And because of his perfectness, his righteousness, his death on the cross, and then he rose from the grave proving he could conquer Satan, sin, and death. He triumphed over all of that, proving that he is the one who is worthy to open the scrolls. Not to mention it proves that he is God, but that's a whole other conversation we could talk about later. And that, my friends, is the God we worship. That, my friends, is the God who I'm hoping is arresting our attention tonight and locking our eyes with him so we can see him in his full glory of who he truly is and that he invites us into his kingdom to be royalty. Royalty, invited into the royal family with him. So, What do we do with that? Like, why did God give us all that? Why did he give John all of that to give to the churches that we would inevitably 2,000 some years later read? Like, are we supposed to just walk away with all of that knowing that God's at the center of everything, God's in control of everything, God is sovereign over everything, that God is working out everything, that, that Jesus is God and he is worthy? Are we supposed to just take all that and then because the book of Revelation is going to talk about the future at some point, we just sit here on our butts and wait for all of that to come to us? Is that what we do? No way. Right? No way. Do we see that God? It's just like when my wife had my full attention, right? It commanded change in my life, right? It drove me, right? It motivated me. It moved me. It changed me. It changed my attitude. It changed my affections. It changed my heart. It changed my life. It changed my life style. So when we see God in all that glory, then his glory is going to do a few things in our life. Four things, and I'll finish up. Number one, it helps us endure tribulation. Right? Helps us endure tribulation. Right? Who's he writing this to? That's what everybody says, John. Right? Everybody say John. John. He's writing John to John. And what's John going through? Exile right? And here's what I love about this book, right? Jesus didn't show up to John and go, well, buddy, how you feeling today, right? But you, ha- you having a hard day today. You want to talk about it, you know, right? He didn't give him a book that's called like five ways to lose weight and feel great, right? He, di- he didn't even pull him out of his situation. He didn't even remove him out of his circumstances, What did Jesus do? He showed him who he was. 
Now, sometimes that's crazy, right? That's crazy talk because sometimes God won't remove you out of a situation because maybe he's trying to reveal more of himself to you. And the only way he can do that is through the situation you're going through. It's crazy how it works out. But when we see God like that, we can endure tribulation. John could endure exile. He can endure the abuse from the Roman government. He could endure all of that tribulation because he knew who was really in control. He knew who was ruling and reigning, right? He knew who was at the center of the Roman government, just like we know who's at the center of the American government. And it's not Donald Trump, right? Okay, I don't care what your political bent is, okay? Don't send me an email about it, all right? The person who's in control here is God. God in all of his glory. And he's not losing any sleep over the thing that you're going through. And he's not distant from it either. We can endure tribulation. I think about the book of Job. Right, remember, Job goes through a whole bunch of suffering. If you know that story, you can go read it. It's a great thing. And for 37 chapters, Job is complaining. And Job's like, why? why? Where are you, God? What's going on? Why? Why is this bad thing happening? Why did all this tragedy happen? Why did all this suffering happen? And you know, for 37 chapters, God's silent. And then in the 38th chapter, you know what he says? He doesn't go, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to go through that. I'm sorry that I let this happen. He didn't even explain why he let it happen. This is, this is just part of it. He looks at Job and he says, who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm? Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Talking about the constellations. He says, have you seen the storehouses that I hold snow and hail in for the time of war? He's like, I hold all of this in my hand. I am God. He doesn't even answer the why. He just reveals more of himself. The glory of God helps us endure tribulation. Oh, by the way, this is why, this is why, right, Jesus, it's, it describes Jesus and it says, with the joy set before him, he endured the cross Right? You think the cross was a painful time in his life? Absolutely. Right? He even prayed, God, if there's another way, take it away. And God said no. Right? So how could he have joy to go through the cross? I think his attention was focused on God and his glory and on you and me being a part of the family. Right? Where's your attention? When our attention's on God, it helps us endure tribulation. It also helps us overcome temptation. Look at your neighbor and say, it'll help you overcome temptation. Come on, somebody help me preach this thing. It'll help you overcome temptation, right? Sometimes, right, sometimes our addictions get so much of our attention. And aren't you tired of the addiction getting all of your attention? And it shouts at you, and it commands you, and it drives you. But sometimes, at some point, we just got to take our eyes off that. By God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, which lives inside, if you're a Christian, we can turn our eyes. Just as John turned and looked at God, we can look at God. And he can get our attention. And then, and then, and then, and then, then, when he gets our eyes and we see the glory of God and we see the pleasures that are at his right hand, right, all of a sudden, I can't take my eyes off that and look at some things on the computer, right? When I enjoy his presence so much more, it's so much greater. Everything else that I felt like I've enjoyed in this world will be fleeting and temporary and unsatisfying when I actually put my attention on God in his glory. It'll help us overcome temptation. So for those who are Christians, we're going to, what we've done tonight is where we have full communion is what we call it available. And if you're a believer, you're a follower of Christ, I want you to take communion tonight. We want you to take communion. Everybody who's in here uh, at the Conway campus, I want you to take communion. And maybe for the first time ever, and maybe just to worship We can remember the body that was broken. Remember the blood that was poured out like we just read. Remember that I was a sinner in need of a savior and Jesus saved me even though I was a sinner. And by his grace, by the power of his spirit that rose Christ from the dead, that I can walk in his steps and I can overcome temptation. I can endure tribulation. But then how about this? Because it's not just about us, right? 
who's given to John to go through John, is given to us to go through us and compel us to mission. Compel us to God's work so that we can pray passionately for people. We can give sacrificially, right? And we can go confidently so every tribe, tongue, and nation will know who God is. And then ultimately, it compels us to worship. Um, Hannah, our kids rock pastor wrote this on her Instagram this week she said I find that the devil is best muted when you're screaming praises to the one who defeated him amen, amen. on November on December 1st um, we're gonna have a worship night a night of worship right here it's a Friday night um, everyone's invited it's gonna set the tone for the holidays set the tone for Christmas um, set the tone right after Thanksgiving and Black Friday and all of that we're going to focus our attention on who God is, and we're going to worship Him. I don't know what you've gone through this week or what you've gone through in your life, but we're going to fix our eyes on who Jesus is. In church, Revelation 5.11 says this. It says, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and i heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worship why don't you do me a favor let's stand up church and let's sing loud and let's sing passionately and let's join with this heavenly host that is right now singing praises of who God is let us respond through prayer let us fall down and worship him through prayer through communion and maybe for the first time ever giving your life to this God to this Savior and I'll be at the back and I would love to talk with you and pray with you about that so let's pray and let's respond church Jesus thank you so much for your word who reveals how great you are how glorious you are God you are in control you are all powerful you are all knowing you are eternal you are good you are faithful you love us you're here for us and we're going to worship you now in Jesus name we pray amen let's respond church